So just, I'm just going to give you a little bit of info about myself. So I live here in San Diego. I've lived here since 1996. I've done, um, been involved in astrology for over 30 years. And um, I was in the corporate world working in neuroscience, but I always did behind the scenes this astrology for everybody. And um, so finally I decided to come out of the closet. <laughs> and uh, in 2017, in fact, Tammy helped me with a lot with this too, I decided to start my own website and then uh, go on to YouTube um, and then I have clients now worldwide. I also do a lot of coaching as well. Um, I mainly follow uh, evolutionary astrology, uh, but I also have uh, psychological uh, types of things that I put in there as well. So where's my son? My son is in Sagittarius, along with um, my north nodes, as well as my Mercury. So there's a big stellium there for myself in the sixth house. And my ascendant is actually in Cancer. So, and my moon is in uh, Scorpio. So I think I kind of have a balance of different things there. My Sagittarian side does come out a lot. <laughs> I do like to take risks. Um, so tonight I'm gonna start off with just the general idea of retrograde motion. And the way I'm gonna do it sort of as a stepwise thing, give you pieces of information that help you over a number of minutes put together what's really happening. And then I'll show you some visuals as well. Then we'll go into each of the planets, find out what happens specifically with them. And then uh, we'll talk about the houses. So the last part of each of these sections is gonna be talking about the houses. That'll be more specific than to your chart. But feel free to ask me questions, like I said, as we go through uh, these slides. All right, so what I want you to get from this, I'm not sure why that keeps going forward. What I want you to get from this particular slide is this. Well, this is our solar system, right? And so this is just an orientation for those that have forgotten our grade six science class. Um, so this here is the sun. Um, next to the sun is what? Mercury. Mercury, and what's after Mercury? Venus. Okay, and then what's after Venus? Good, okay, and then? Okay, now what do you notice about the orbits here in particular? Yeah, so they're elliptical, right? Yeah, and so that's one of the important things that I want you to bear in mind when you're thinking about these retrogrades happening. When you've got this elliptical type of orbit, it actually then allows the planet to either go faster or slower depending where in the orbit it is, in its own orbit, right? Okay. This is just another rep representation of the same thing. Okay, so before we get into, just so we get an idea of the attributes of each of these planets, and I'm gonna get the audience to also participate in this. So when you think about Mercury, what do you think of? Communications, for sure. Anything else? Remember, remembering Mercury rules uh, both Virgo as well as Gemini. Intellect, yep. The mind. Learning. Learning, yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, and gathering information too, right? Maybe writing, uh-huh. Short travel, that's a good one. Who gave that one? I like that. <laughs> Okay, let's go on to Venus. So we always think of Venus as love, but what else can it be? And what, what is the energy from Venus? Does anybody have an idea about what that is? Say opposed to, hmm? What's that? Yeah, yeah. Anything else? Artistic, yeah, yeah. Money, yep, that's a good one. And it's also our, our social norms too, right? So when we, we can just do a little bit of like moving ahead when we're thinking about these retrogrades, and if we're talking about Venus and we associate it with social norms, this could be something that may happen on a more uh, global basis when we have the Venus retrograde, right? Our ideas of beauty may change, our ideas of art may change. Women may be more important. All right, what about Mars? We talk about Mars with energy, but what else is it? 
Action, for sure. <laughs> okay. Fighting. Fighting and or wars too, right? That can be that too. Exercise. Yeah. Aggression. Aggression, assertion. How you exert your will. Yeah, that's a good one too. Because it's very much associated with ego to some extent too, right? So then this also tells us that with the Mars retrograde here, we know that element of an ego is going to be involved, and it's probably not going to be pretty <laughs> if it gets out of hand. Okay. All right, let's, let's get into the actual part of the planets retrograding. I'll read from these slides a little bit, but mostly I'm just going to talk about it. So one of the main concepts about any retrograde is that in the orbit around the sun, let's say it's Mercury, Venus or Mars, what happens is, is the Earth in its orbit catches up with that planet, right? That's one of the biggest concepts to remember. Um, now here I've got an example. Most astrologers seem to use this. How can we visualize that or intellectualize that in my head so I understand it? So we know that any of these retrogrades is from the view of the Earth. Right? So we've got to remember that. It's not the view from the sun, for instance. In fact, if it was for the, from the sun, there would be no retrogrades. So this is also always the view of that. And then the other thing to bear in mind is that Mars is in its orbit outside of the Earth, right? So you know that that planet's going to be moving a lot slower than Earth, too. And the perspective is going to be different, right? So we've got Earth looking at the sun, Mercury and Venus, and then the Earth has behind it Mars, right? So that's the order of how it all works with the orbits of the planets. Okay, so what we can do is use this idea. We're on a freeway or a highway, and we're going 80 miles an hour. Someone to the right of us is only going 50 or 60 miles an hour. And so where we look, to the side at this car as we're going faster and we see that it's going apparently backward, but in reality it's not, right? Both, and the th same thing can be brought in with trains as well, but if we just use the cars, we know we're, we're both going forward, but it appears like it's going backward, but it isn't. It's that same idea with any of the retrogrades uh, that we look at. Does that make sense? Yeah, okay. So when we look at retrogrades, that is one part of a larger cycle called the synodic cycle. And you've probably heard this, especially the synodic cycle of Venus is talked about a lot. Synodic, basically, if you translate it, it means meeting or meeting up. And the meeting up is, typically we're talking about the sun. So here we have another thing coming into the picture is the sun is very important with regards to anything to do with not only the retrogrades, which are part of the synodic cycle, but also the synodic cycle itself. And for, um, I'm gonna show it a little bit further on, this is just the text, but for both Mercury and Venus, that starts, that synodic cycle starts, it's something called the inferior conjunction. And I'm gonna show you a visual of that in the moment. Um, what have we got here? For Mercury, the synodic cycle is 116 days. Um, for Venus, it's 584 or 1.9 years. So that's the, the typical time that we're looking at from one retrograde happening, and we're talking about Mercury here and Venus, and the next one happening, right? So for Mercury, it's about, um, we have about three to four Mercury retrogrades a year because the orbit is so fast around the sun, so it gets an opportunity to connect with the Earth's orbit a lot more times during the year. All right, and then for Mars, yeah, Mars is a little different. Um, Mars does more like the superior conjunction as opposed to the inferior conjunction, but we'll just put that aside for right now. What I've done here is give you an idea of when that started. So this encapsulates the time period for Mars. Mars is more like about 26 months or two Earth years. 
in terms of the cycle. And here we're talking about the one that is ongoing right now. It, so it started on the 17th of November, 2023, right? And it's going to start another two year cycle on the 6th of Jan, 2026 at 15 Capricorn. So this is just kind of heads up, right? That the next one after this for Mars is going to be at 15 Capricorn in January, 2026, right? But the other thing that goes along this with Mars is, is Mars will have an opposition with the sun. So we're bringing the sun back in here again. And it will be halfway through the retrograde cycle. And that's going to be on the 9th of Jan, 2026. And it's the same thing with Mercury as well as Venus. It's halfway through the cycle that you get this uh, interaction with the sun. So it's important to make note of those time periods as well, because typically what we're talking about when we've got this interaction with the sun happening halfway through any of these three retrogrades, it represents a time when things may become clearer for you. In the case of Mercury, it could be a time when you, you get an idea about how you can go forward with something. Um, uh, literally, a communication comes through that says, oh, maybe I should do it this way. For Venus, it could have you, if you're, say, reviewing, typical Venus retrograde would be reviewing maybe a relationship or having a relationship come in from the past. This time period halfway through when it interacts with the sun could be an aha moment of saying, okay, I know what to do now with this relationship that either is ongoing right now, because that can happen too, or was in the past. And for Mars, Mars tends to bring in a lot of frustration in a retrograde. And so this halfway time point with the sun with Mars can give you some ideas about, oh, I know now how I can take action. I know if I do this thing, it will equal this. So instead of sitting with the frustration, you actually have some ideas of how you can go forward with some kind of action. All right, let me just see if there's other dates here that you wanna put down. Um, yeah, so Mars uh, opposes the sun on the 16th of Jan next year at 26 degrees of Cancer. We'll talk a little bit more about that Mars retrograde because it's quite an interesting one that's uh, coming up for you. Okay, let's go on to the next slide. All right, so this, this particular slide is showing us a few things. We're seeing here, the one on the left here um, is just an idea of where right now we actually have the different elements of our solar system, including the Earth happening. But when we look at this one here on my, on the right, when I'm looking at it, this is when we're talking about that whole inferior conjunction and superior conjunction, right? So in terms of the inf inferior conjunction, we have the Earth, and this would either be Venus and or Mercury, right? Not necessarily all three of them there at the same time. Um, and then what has to happen is, it goes on to have the superior conjunction. The superior conjunction just means that that planet is behind the sun. Earth is not necessarily involved in this as this conjunction is here with the inferior. But these planets, Mercury and Venus, have to go all the way around, have the superior conjunction, and then conjunct again at the inferior conjunction. And as I mentioned, there's, there's different time periods for all three of these. Uh, planets. But that's the general idea. Now to complicate matters, <laughs> that word inferior is used for other things too. So both Mercury and Venus are referred to as inferior planets because they're on the inside of Earth and in between Earth and the Sun. But Mars is a superior planet because it's after the Earth as well as all the other outer planets are also called superior planets. So in addition to the retrograde, which I have already mentioned, is when the Earth catches up with either Mercury, Venus, or in this case, Mars we're talking about. We have two shadow periods. So the shadow periods are on the periods uh, before the retrograde, and they are the period after the retrograde. And you figure out those dates 
based on the degree, first of all, that the planet goes direct at, and then the second shadow period is the one where it actually went retrograde at. So you get a time uh, period of what's happening here with regards to the shadow periods at the retrograde and then the second shadow period. Um, how many people here have found that the shadow periods really play into a retrograde? Like let's just say that the either three of these retrogrades aspect something in your chart. Have you found the shadow period also? Yeah, uh, this last Mercury retrograde just killed me, I'm telling you. <laughs> no, it was one of the worst I've ever, and it seems like we were talking earlier, it seems like it's still continuing on. Um, yeah, yeah, okay, that's interesting. Okay, so let's get the actual uh, time periods and degrees for each of these. So after we've looked at all the shadow periods, we have the upcoming Mercury retrograde is gonna be in Sagittarius and it's gonna stay in Sagittarius, right? Um, it will start at 22 degrees of Sagittarius uh, on the 26th of November, 2024. So you might wanna note that. I did put that in the handout as well. Um, and then uh, on the 15th of December, 2024, at uh, six Sagittarius, uh, it will go direct. But the interesting thing about this Mercury retrograde, the start of it at 22 degrees of Sagittarius, is that that's the same degree that the last Mercury retrograde went direct on the 1st of Jan, 2024. I did have something happen kind of dramatic to me during that time period. Uh, so, and I, my Mercury is at 22 degrees of Sagittarius, so I'll let you know what happens to me. But <laughs> I'm gonna be revisiting that whole situation that I was in um, during this time period as well, because we got, my Mercury is uh, highlighted again for a second time. So even if that's not the case, and you did have, say, something happen back, so this would have been towards, this would have been in December 2023, and then with the direct Mercury um, on the 1st of Jan this year, if there was something that did come up at that time that was significant for you, you can expect that it's going to come up again here at this Mercury retrograde too. Yes? If, it, if your natal was at 29, Sag, would you then What happened to you during the last Mercury retrograde? So that would have been December 2023 through the beginning of Jan 2024. Or you don't have to say what happened, but was no, there something that happened? Yeah, I can think of something that happened. Yeah, because yeah. that would have been at the same degree point, 22 degrees, even though it's not 29. I'm a little bit of a stickler. I really like really close orbs. I just, I've just found that when I do my predicting, if I go much more than say three or so degrees, but then you have to go back to, well, what did happen to me when that mercury that went direct was at 22 degrees? I would say if there was something that happened to you that this particular time, do you know what um, house it's in? My natal. Yeah, your natal house. 11. Your 11th house. So did something come up at that time with regards to your friends? Okay. So this, this what may happen is it may get resolved because you're going to be starting where you ended, right? Well, I think it really... Ah, so could this be a, a new start for you where you start identifying new friends or, or new friends come forward and you say, that's more like the friend I want. Yeah, okay. So then that's what I would expect. But I mean, you know, the 11th house, a lot of people forget that's also hopes, dreams, and wishes too, you know. Yeah, and maybe, maybe it also involves you getting involved in new groups to meet new friends. Keep coming here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, let's get on to here to the next one. So Venus. So Venus isn't till next year. And Venus will be at, it's so close to 11, that's why I put 10, 11 degrees of Aries on the 2nd of March, 2025. Does anybody have anything around that degree point? 10 or 11 uh, Aries. Um, and then on the 2nd of... Yeah, that's the 2nd of March, and then it'll go direct on the 13th of April at 24 Pisces. Anyone have anything at that, 24 Pisces? Okay. We're going to be covering each of the houses, okay, for all these towards the end 
uh, of each of the sections that I go, so don't worry, we will go through all the houses. Um, something that stood out for me on this particular um, Venus or retrograde, because there's gonna be a Mercury retrograde going on exactly the same time, so we're looking at March and April of uh, 2025, and it almost mimics the Mercury retrograde, so this is a second Mercury re retrograde I'm talking about, mimics the Venus retrograde. So I think March and April next year, and I'm seeing this more on a mundane or global level, are gonna be very significant months. And I would say that um, my thought was, because I'm optimistic Sagittarian, um, that we start off with Aries war, right? We've got this war of, well, we've got two gigantic, there's always lots of wars going on, but there's two big ones going on right now. U Ukraine and Israel and Gaza. I'm hoping that this, these months of March and April are months that bring us attention to the war, that's Aries, but that it also brings in this element of peace, that's Pisces. So I'm just, I'm getting this recorded as well, so I'm gonna put, it, put, my, uh, put my two thoughts out there. All right, so let's move on to Mars. So Mars is gonna start off in Leo and then really spend an enormous amount of time in Cancer. Um, I have a Cancer ascendant, and I think there's somebody else here who's got a cancer in it too. So if you've got almost anything significant in um, cancer, you're going to be affected by this Mars because Mars will stay in 2025 in cancer, whether it's retrograde or direct, for about three months. And then don't forget, we have a shadow period that's gonna be happening in 2024, as well as the retrograde starting. So it starts on 6 Leo, and that's on the 5th of December this year. And then it ends at 17 Cancer on the 24th of Feb, uh, 2025. I think this is going to be a, um, a very significant Mars for the USA. And why am I saying that? Because in the USA chart, and you can, when you go home or whatever or this weekend, you can go check it out. But in the USA chart, the north nodes for the USA are at what? six degrees of Leo. So we know for sure that this Mars retrograde is going to be very active in, for the USA itself. No question of it. And I mean, if you think about it, I know the election's on the 5th but, of November, but this isn't so far off. This is like a month later. And we know that, we know that whoever actually gets in, and we, I think we all think we know who's gonna get in, uh, there's not gonna be anything settled. And so I think that's what this Mars retrograde is gonna be in. Now, if we think of cancer, what do we think of when we think of cancer? Most of this retrograde is gonna be happening in cancer, and as I said, it's gonna spend three months in cancer, retrograde or direct, next year. We go from Leo being proud, prideful, ego, and this could also represent royalty too, by the way. Um, and then we go into cancer, so we go from that, the ego, into what, when we look at cancer? Anyone got some ideas here? The home, the homeland. Emotional type things, that's right. Yeah, actually, for sure. Yeah, if we th put the Mars and the Cancer together. Mars is not happy necessarily in Cancer. Um, what's up? It is in its fall, that's right. Um, the other thing I was thinking was because there's so much going on with regards to being a mother, right? Um, and cancer does represent the family, but in particular the mother as well. And if we think of all the issues that are in front of us right now, it's unbelievable. Actually, it's, a lot of it's unbelievable that's going on. I try not to watch too much YouTube because I get so upset. So I think that's what's gonna be happening next year. Maybe that uh, Roe versus Wade, that whole thing is gonna come back again to be reinstated for us. That's what I was thinking when I looked at this because of this huge influence. But guess what? There's gonna be frustrations around it, right? Because we've got that Mars retrograde almost always brings in frustrations. Um, and you know, maybe even some behind the scenes activity with people that aren't uh, vested in having a woman choose um, you know, how she wants her body uh, treated. But I think that's what this Mars retrograde is gonna bring up in the USA. And also at a higher level, because we're talking about the North Nodes being activated here, this is the USA destiny. And when I looked at this, I actually got goosebumps. And I said, whoa, this 
election truly is going to change our destiny, more so than any other elect election for certainly a long time. Anyway, that's my opinion of what I think is going to be happening. Any other questions on that part of it? We're still going to cover more of each of these two. But I have noticed. Yes. When in the foreshadow before the retrograde, yep. something happened at a particular degree. It seems to reappear during the retrograde and again in the, in the foreshadow. That's right. So it's like three aspects of the same problem. Exactly, yes. Uh, interesting to notice. Yeah, so you could do, that's a good point. So what you could do too is, even if you don't have these degrees from Mars, you could do just like you've said, is you can look at when does the, the pre-shadow period have, what date is that? When is the retrograde actually starting? We know that. And then what's the post-shadow period as well? What dates are those happening around? And because those are probably the dates that we have a lot of activity happening for better or for worse. I think this is going to bring up that whole thing, more so than it's being brought up right now. So when do we have a morning star? When do we have an evening star? Generally speaking, when we're in retrograde, we tend to have what's called the morning star. It's a little different with Mars. Um, Mars tends to, because of its position in its orbit outside the Earth, and we're still looking from the Earth at Mars, I put down here some things about Mars can actually be both. It can be the evening as well as the um, uh, morning star. And certainly for most of December here, we're going to be having uh, Mars in the evening sky. And for those folks that like to get out to the evening and look at the stars and the planets, I did make note here that these are the times where it will be the brightest. So you can get out at night and take a look from November 14th to December 28th this year. And you'll be able to see Mars twinkling up in the sky and it'll be sort of a little bit of a red color. All right. So this is a depiction of, you can use this free program of those that are interested in looking at the sky astronomically. It's called Stellarium and it's free if you wanna get it. That's how this was produced here. And this tells us where everything is right now. I mean, I just picked those three planets and Earth. So right now, this is where they are. We've got the sun there in the ecliptic. We've got Mercury close by. Um, the Earth is also close to the ecliptic. And then Venus is further down, right? In fact, we almost have a couple uh, oppositions and conjunctions happening here. Okay, so this, this is another add-on to understanding when we see this picture. So this is a, the picture here on, um, right here, is a Mercury retrograde. This picture was taken over the three weeks that we have a Mercury retrograde and then put together in one picture so you can see how it loops around. But basically all the retrogrades do this. So, but this just gives you an idea. But then you say, well, why is it kind of loopy like this? Like, I don't quite get what it is. And that's where this may help you. So this also has the ecliptic, and it has Mars and Venus in particular on this. And you can see that on this orbit, right, sometimes it's above the ecliptic, sometimes it's below the ecliptic. And so this also is what contributes to when we look at that looping around type thing, right? And what this really um, refers to is um, yeah, it's basically what's called declination. I don't want to get into the declination thing, but basically declination is just from the ecliptic. It's either above it or below it. So that's probably the easiest way to understand, understand declination. And so declination is also involved in this visual of the Mercury retrograde. A lot of astrologers don't talk about that. They just talk about you know, that it seems to go backwards and Earth conjuncts this planet. But this is part of it too. Now the other part of it is that all, all three of these planets, including Earth of course, they all have a tilt. And I won't go through each one of these, but here's the different tilts. And it's interesting, Mars has a very similar tilt to the Earth, which is around 24, 25 degrees. 
So that tilt is also going to affect what you see here, right? So there's all these things now I've built up for you with regards to the Mercury retrograde, but why astronomically it actually turns out like this, loops and sometimes S's too. So let's get into the Mercury retrograde itself. This is just a nice little picture. We know that Mercury is the closest planet to the sun, so the chances of you seeing it when it's <laughs> right by the sun um, is remote. But this is a picture taken from NASA, and this here is Mercury next to the sun. And then this just is a depiction um, of the motion that happens, right? So it, it just reinforces what I've just said. We've got the sun here, we've got Mercury here, and we've got the Earth here, conjuncting Mercury during that um, Mercury retrograde time period and moving beyond it. Okay, we've already talked about most of this. Yeah, I'll just talk about, I've already covered the time periods for you. I can repeat it again if you want, but basically what I do want you to just take a look at is this. So the last Sagittarius Mercury retrograde was December 2023, and this was the Israel-Hamas or Palestinian war started. That was when Israel invaded the Gaza Strip. So this may also be something that comes up for what? Discussion, right? Negotiation at the Mercury retrograde because this went forward, this last Mercury retrograde last year went forward at 20, 20, 22 degrees of Sagittarius and we have the retrograde starting this year in December at that same degree. It could bring that up. The other thing that happened was, and I'd forgotten about this, Pope Francis allowed um, priest to uh, bless same-sex couples at this time. So something may rear its head about that one too. Well, I think it already has, but <laughs> there may be something more significant. All right. So this just speaks to, I'll just spend a couple minutes on this. We already talked about the Venus retrograde and the dates for that. But I mentioned that we're also going to have a Mercury retrograde in 2025 at that same time. And this just gives you the degrees for the Mercury part. I've already given you the Venus. So it retrogrades at nine Aries on the 15th of March next year and goes direct at 27 on the 7th of April. And I'm just giving you some ideas here of what could actually happen. Mercury in particular retrograde. We kind of classically talk about computers breaking down, phones not working, communications going awry, um, that type of thing. Don't sign contracts. Um, I'm not sure if any other astrologers follow my logic, but what I do, and I personally do this for Mercury retrogrades if I have it aspected in my chart, if I've already undergone a lot of discussions already, say regarding buying a home. In fact, this did happen to me. Um, and I've months prior dealt with finding the home I want. Uh, we haven't signed the contract yet, but I pretty well found where I want to go. I'm looking at houses now. I've got everybody and everything lined up, but no contract signed. And then we are going to sign <coughs> around a Mercury retrograde. I will go ahead and sign. So I've not found this to be adverse. It's that you don't want to go into the Mercury retrograde and then go ahead and sign contracts. I would avoid that. But hey, as Rick Levine says, well, you know, we've got three or four of these a year and they last about three weeks each. You can't stop your life, right? So in that case where you do have to sign a contract or something akin to that, I would just suggest that you really go over the details. And if you have any confusion about any of them, that you actually ask questions or even take it to someone like a lawyer, say you're buying a house, and look at those details really carefully. Any confusion or misunderstanding, ensure you ask questions. That's the best you can do when you are forced to, say, sign something. Or a business partnership, say, for instance, that kind of thing, too. Um, so the last, I'll just give this to you just as a historic thing. So the last thing uh, I want to talk about here was with Mercury is that the retrograde, the last one we had, uh, was the 5th of August um, at 4 Virgo. 
and then the 28th of August at 21 Leo is uh, when it went direct. And this definitely affected me for sure. Okay. And then this is, the next one is just the chart. I know they're kind of small on your handout, but I wanted you to have the chart so when you go back over the next few months, you can look at the chart and see not only the Mercury retrograde or the Venus retrograde or the Mars retrograde, but you can see where the other planets are, right? Okay, so this is Mercury we're talking about. So here we are. Mercury's at 22 degrees right here. This is done for, Sa for San Diego. We don't tend to look at the houses because it's, it's not gonna be transferable to each of you individually, but we do look at the planets. Well, what if we, can you see here what might be aspecting this Mercury at this Mercury retrograde start? Can anybody see, is it clear enough this or not? If it isn't, it's okay, I'll tell you what it is. We have Uranus up here. Nine squares Neptune. Yep. What about Jupiter? Can you see, this is Jupiter here, if you can't quite make it out. It's, so Jupiter is almost at 18 of Gemini. So what are we talking about? We're talking about an opposition here, right, with Mercury. Let's go back to what is Jupiter, what is Jupiter and Gemini to refer to? Communications. Jupiter says foreign nations, foreign lands, right? And then <laughs> we have Mercury in the sign that Jupiter rules, Sagittarius. So this again, when I looked at this on a mundane level said to me, okay, this could also be a time period, this Mercury retrograde where real serious negotiations are undertaken here with regards to foreign people and foreign lands. Now maybe it's gonna be for another reason, maybe it's not gonna be the wars that are going on, but I suspect it will be. Does anybody have anything uh, around 22 Sag or something in Gemini? Yeah. Mercury is in Sagittarius, 16 degrees, four Okay, so you're gonna have Jupiter oppose that. So, and a Jupiter I'm assuming is in your 10th house. Yeah. Yeah, so this is gonna be an interaction between some kind of maybe miscommunications to do with the home, but it can also be the family and or your mother and your career. But the 10th house can also stand for things like your reputation, your social standing, that type of thing. And having, just as an aside, I'm not gonna read your chart here, but to have Jupiter in your 10th house, so this is about a 12, it's just over a 12 year cycle. So you look relatively young. I don't know if you go back 12 years uh, from now, what that will equal, but you could do that. You could say, well, what happened 12 years ago? But that is one of the, that's a fantastic place to have Jupiter. And certainly if you want to get involved in say your career is to anything to do with communications, anything to do with um, sales and commerce, and maybe where there's short distance travel involved, this just makes it real good. So if you're applying for new jobs or trying to start a new career, I'm just saying that's off, off the charts for you. And that influence of Jupiter is gonna be there for a while, right? It'll be off um, your planet, but it will actually be uh, there till about June of 2025, still operating in your 10th house, if we do whole house systems, right? Anybody else got something that, yes? Sad. Okay, so this is going to be um, a direct hit. What house is that in? Uh, it's my ascendant, the right, and Neptune's in the first house. So your ascendant is Sag, mm -hmm. and then your Neptune's in the first house, yeah. just past your ascendant, okay. Um, hmm. Have you got something coming up with regards to the metaphysical world, are you getting educated somehow with regards to the metaphysical world, especially healing that may involve travel, may involve you going to an ashram or something like that? Uh, I'm going to Astro Bash in I saw that, I saw that advertised, yeah. Um, you know, it's, it's still before the Mercury retrograde starts, but you still may have something happen that maybe uh, something turns up at that time, some say some kind of communication of some sort for you that involves the metaphysical world to some extent. Or maybe something also, I mean, Neptune can also bring in a confusion type thing as well. It just all depends how it plays out. Um, but you could be going back over that during the, this whole Mercury retrograde 
like say whatever happens there. Let's just say it's a spiritual thing that happens. It really makes you feel good and you didn't quite understand it or whatever. You could take it maybe to the next level is what I'm thinking because it's first house ascendant, right? Um, at that, at the Mercury retrograde, you said, you know, I'm going to do some more studying on that. And maybe you even reach out to some of the people you met. Maybe they'll be foreign people, right? It's because that big foreign connection there. Um, or it may involve you taking the next step and maybe going somewhere overseas or working with foreign people or contacting foreign people, right? Um, so there's going to be a connection, I think, with that uh, bash that you're going to and then this Mercury retrograde. I have a feeling you may go back and do some studying. I mean, typically we talk about Sagittarius being advanced um, degrees, but, you know, it's both the third house and um, the ninth house as well as Gemini and Sagittarius. They all have to do with learning too. Sagittarius has more to do with the learning of uh, where's my place in the world? And as you expose yourself more to the world, you find where your place is. That's the idea. And that may happen to you. I'm getting an intuition that that may happen to you. That may be a really important thing you're going to write. Someone else had that? Yep. I have your eyes, so I have 20 degrees of almost 21 degrees. Of Sagittarius? And then I have a stellium in Gemini, but my Mercury is 26. Gemini is 8, so second house for uh, realizing that you're the center of the universe. So, I mean, that Uranus is going to be a generational thing, too, right? I mean, the houses will be different for each individual in your generation. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, your ninth house could have you doing some kind of big trip overseas or something, or just, I'm going to go live in a foreign country, um, or taking unexpected travel, right? That could be fun, too. So you have the second house, Uranus. I mean, Uranus is one of those planets that can kind of go either way. I always say try to, when you know you've got something like this coming up, which you do, um, try to take a really high road look at things. We know that the second house is a money house. But the other thing a lot of people forget is value and value of yourself. This is what I've got to say to you. Value who you are. Maybe you need to change something here so that when you go for that job or you go for that increase in whatever money you're getting in the job, you actually get it. It's like an enlightenment type thing. Now, it can bring on a sort of a basic level, it can bring money into your life, but it can take money out as well. So this could be a time where you have unexpected expenses come in that you didn't reckon for. If it was me, I would definitely put some money to the side, uh, in it, even a small amount, just keep it to the side just in case something does come up and you've got some access, access to funds. But it could unexpectedly bring something in. If this is something, what I'm talking about is something that resonates with you, valuing yourself and having the money equate to your value that you have, then you absolutely must meditate about that. So this is outside of astrology kind of. Meditate about it. I, I recommend this to a lot of my clients. You should put a vision board together if, if that appeals to you. Can't tell you what to do. Um, because I think this is a turning point, right? And so, yeah. Yeah, and then the, that that Mercury there is going to bring something in potentially for you. You may negotiate. So you really have to have a, a clear understanding. This is what I'm bringing to this job. This is the money I should be earning, and this is why. So figure that out now so when those opportunities come in, you're ready. That's how I would, that's how I would do it. Okay. All right, that was the only thing that really stood out for me in this chart, in just this chart. Obviously, we each individually have stuff too. Um, Okay, we'll leave that now. Let's keep going. We're almost, we're almost finished with Mercury here. How are we doing for time? Well, it's 7.52, so we have about 15 more minutes. Okay. Um, then let's, let's finish off with this whole, I don't know why this keeps going forward, but it does. Let's go through all the houses. And this is going to be a, um, I'm not going to ask you to come up and sing. <laughs> it won't be karaoke, <laughs> but I'd like you to participate if you can. I did put in your handout just basic words. I, I wish I had had more, um, many, many more sheets to give you that I can, you know, tell you what each of these houses are. But let's just do this. So you've got this already uh, in your handout, but it may bring up some other conversations that we can have with people who maybe haven't had a chance to say anything. So let's go quickly through these Mercury in the houses for the next 15 minutes. So the first house, 
Mercury in the first house, communications. This is the time when you know, you really can have computers break down, your phone not work. You lose your phone, you lose your computer. I've had that happen to me. And um, a delay in contracts. So that's the other thing that can happen in the first house. And if you've had an experience of a Mercury retrograde in one of these houses, feel free to speak up and let us know what happened. All right, so the second house, going back to the money, going back to the values. Now, this house, I'm thinking more from the standpoint of inner work. And the inner work would be, how do I value myself? How do people out there value me? And how is that playing out with regards to the money I'm getting in? So this is a fantastic way to spend a Mercury retrograde in the second house. Um, but it can have some kind of difficult, say, negotiations, not things not quite straightforward, negotiating money. Especially negotiating money where you think you're not being valued. The third house, so this is the house that, one of the houses that Mercury rules. The third house is basically communications itself. This is, I've had this happen to me and I, on a regular basis, when I have this happening in the third house, I go through my spam folders and I go through all the folders, you know, where all, all our email is <laughs> divided up into all these things. And the number of times I've had this happen where for some reason it's gone into spam from a client that really wanted me to contact them. That's the sort of thing you want to do with Mercury Retrograde in the third house. Um, you can also have communications kind of go awry with both neighbors as well as siblings because they're at play too here. Now, although this isn't a Mars retrograde, I also think that the Mercury in this house of short journeys, the third house, can also bring some confusion with regards to, say, short journeys. Say you drive to work every day for a couple miles. This Mercury retrograde could bring in some delays or problems. Okay, so if that's the case, then in advance of this happening, you wanna know a different route. Okay. Um, so now we go on to the fourth house. And this essentially can bring in arguments basically and misunderstandings with the family, especially the mother. That's associated with the fourth house here. But it can also bring in delays or miscommunications with regards to selling a house, buying a house. That can happen here too. Uh, when we look at the fifth house, this is miscommunications with children miscommunications with, say, a new love that you've started to develop, miscommunications with, say, create a project of some sort. This certainly would not be a good time, if you've got Mercury Retrograde in your fifth house, to start a business. The fifth house rules starting your own business is not having your own business. I would not start if you can just delay it. It's a three-year uh, or a three-week time period. I definitely would not be putting um, my company, my new company, starting on a Mercury Retrograde if it's in the fifth house. The sixth house is also ruled by Mercury, just in a different way. So this is miscommunications at your day-to-day -day job, or if you do not work, it's the activities you do. There's miscommunications there. There can also be miscommunications with regards to health. So if I had this, I'd be saying, okay, so this might be a good time for me to talk to my boss about maybe getting a raise, or talk to my boss about moving into that other job or look around at other jobs potentially, maybe go on Indeed or one of those uh, search engines to start looking for a potential new job that I wanna do. That's a good time to use the Mercury Retrograde. Not to pull the trigger, but just to start identifying, maybe even to start interviewing, just not signing the contract at that time. It can also bring in things like, um, I I've had this happen once to me in my lifetime where someone had exactly the same name as me they did almost exactly the same job as me, and they lived two exits from me. And I had the, um, the clinic phone me up and say, well, you gotta come in here for your x-ray now, you know, you know, this is really important. <laughs> I'm thinking, what are you talking about? Um, and then we found out that this woman had exactly the same name as me, but she did have, because I'd see her turning up at the hotels I was, not physically, but they would confuse me at the hotel sometimes. And then I knew she was doing a similar job to me as well, which was mainly in the healthcare industry. Um, so that sort of thing can happen. A mix up in say lab results. So if you do have some say weird lab result turn up during a mercury retrograde in your sixth house, double check it. Second opinions, also a good thing to do in a mercury retrograde because maybe the first one was not right. Okay. 
Seventh house, okay, this is the house of the other. And this is where I think the one house where I would say you really do have to take care about miscommunicating. Before you put foot in mouth, think carefully. So it's all those people out there. Now typically we talk about the marriage partner, business partnerships, or clients. But it really can be any other. It could be um, anything like uh, a financial consultant that you have, um, someone that you consult about exercising or something like that. Anywhere where you might sign a contract with somebody is the seventh house. So I would make sure that if you do, let's just say it's your spouse, and there's some kind of, you know, something's not right here. There's a lot of miscommunications going on and maybe even arguments. You've got to learn to take that 10,000 foot. I've had to practice this. <laughs> I'm not perfect at it. Take the 10,000 foot view, especially with Mercury retrograde in the seventh house. That has always stood out for me. And always take this uh, idea of, okay, there's a problem here. Let's see if we can have a win-win situation. All right. Um, the eighth house. So this is kind of a hidden house too, like the 12th house in some respects. It is a money house as well, but it's also the house of your psychological mind. This would be a great time period in Mercury retrograde to figure out somebody that might be able to help you with some sort of psychotherapy. Psychological help here would be fantastic with a Mercury retrograde. But it is a time to review your finances. It might also be a time to change your financial advisor. So if you've got it happening in this house, um, you've got to pay attention to your investments. If, say, you're retiring, I had this happen to me too. I can't remember if it was a, a Mercury retrograde. It probably was. Um, I retired early from my corporate job. And I'm telling you, to sort out all my stuff so I could retire and get money come in took me not quite a year. And it was very frustrating where there wasn't, nothing was really straightforward. And I had to do a lot of contacting, a lot of recontacting. Um, before I could even do that to access my funds. So that's just a little heads up for you, my experience. Um, the eighth house is also the house of sex. There could be some miscommunications with regard to that area of your life as well. The ninth house is kind of a nice house, generally speaking. That is travel, though. That's what stands out for me the most. So I wouldn't necessarily plan to travel during a Mercury retrograde. Um, you may have frustrations trying to catch your plane. The plane may be canceled. Um, if you do have your Mercury retrograde happening in the ninth house and travel is going to be coming up, whether you like it or not, make sure that you get travel insurance. So I'm going to give you practical advice to travel insurance and that you understand the travel insurance, what, what you have to do to get it. Because that is not always clear. I've also had issues with that. Um, the ninth house, too, is legal matters, so legal matters could, for some reason, get delayed. Um, it is also higher education, so for those folks that are going back for higher education, I went back uh, later in life for higher education, and um, I would say that you just need to check all the boxes. Make sure that when you're uh, applying for the higher education that you know all the rules and regulations. Use the Mercury retrograde to find out what those rules and regulations are. Um, anything else? Did I miss anything else with the ninth house? Hmm. It's also meaning in life. And occasionally I'll put, I do a lot of uh, YouTube videos, and I try to remember that the ninth house is meaning in life. So for those that are in that frame of mind, and at that point in their life where they really are looking at their life, and where do I have meaning, this Mercury retrograde could have you going internally in your mind asking, do I have meaning in my life here? And that Mercury retrograde could be taken to look at what is it that I could do here to bring more meaning in my life. Okay, we're almost there, Tammy. Um, the 10th house, mainly it's a career house, but it can affect your reputation and your social standing. The 10th house is predicated by the midheaven angle. And the midheaven angle basically refers or is a point in your chart where you make announcements where big things may happen for you, where you may change your job, you may announce you're getting married, when you're gonna maybe announce when you're getting divorced, maybe announce I've, I'm pregnant, I've got a new child coming into my life. So that midheaven starts the 10th house. And then we talk about the 10th house being your career. So certainly if you are planning on changing your career and you've got this Mercury retrograde in the 10th house, it just could bring some frustrations in for you. It doesn't mean that you still shouldn't pursue going ahead. If it was me, I would probably consider a mentor 
or someone that's a little more experienced than me and actually consult with them, say you have to do this, you have to change your career. Um, uh, that's what I would do for the 10th house. But it can just bring in frustrations, generally speaking, especially with communicating anybody, like for instance, your superiors. Um, the 11th house. So this could be arguments and delays with friends. I spoke to someone earlier, I think, about um, this, where they had this featured in their chart. So again, just you know, try to keep an open mind with regards to the other person's point of view. It could also have groups that you belong to where you're not happy with what they're saying or you disagree with what they're saying. Nothing wrong with disagreeing. It's how you present it to the other person or in this case, maybe a group. Now, the other thing the 11th house represents is your hopes, dreams, and wishes. So you may have gotten really excited about, oh, I can I see this coming, it's gonna happen. I, I'm gonna have this wish of mine come true. And then the Mercury retrograde happens and it seems now that there's a delay. It doesn't mean it won't happen though. I always remind that to people. So we end with the 12th house. This is called a hidden house. It's the very last. It is ruled by Pisces and then the sign of, or the, the planet is Neptune. And so here there's gonna be problems happening that maybe aren't so obvious. This is where you could have people working behind the scenes, kind of behind your back. It's the hidden enemies type thing. That's kind of the worst side of this that could happen. But it could have you, for some reason, having to go over some kind of communications or maybe spend extra long on some kind of communications in hidden places. Hidden places like government offices. Uh, hidden places like uh, hospitals. It's also ashrams which brings me to the positive side of Mercury retrograde in the 12th house. Hey, take some time off, go to that ashram and really chill out, let your mind go and get some rest. Because the 12th house is also the house of rest. And in particular, we're talking about resting the mind when we're talking about Mercury, right? Okay, um, any questions about, we're gonna, I think, end here. It's pretty close to 15 minutes, I think. Um, Anything else about Mercury? Because we're going to end here with Mercury and then we're going to go on to Venus after the break. And it can be any question. Don't feel shy. Yeah. Yes, that's the basic idea. I mean, yeah. What, what degrees have you got the stellium at? Okay, so we're looking at around the 22 degree mark and then the six degree mark. So it looks like you've got all three of those are aspected. So you'll start off the retrograde, I mean, you'll have the shadow period prior, but if we just stay in the retrograde period itself, it'll start at 22. And that was what planet? Uh, Neptune. Neptune. And it's in what? Eleven. So this could bring up some confusion with regards to your friends. Is Sagittarius almost, the six degrees to 22 degrees, is that all the 11th house? No, I have, it goes into your uh, Jupiter and uh, Uranus, and the 10th house. Ah, okay, hmm. So you could have something come up with, um, could have something come up with friends or groups that you belong to that somehow affect your career in the end. I'm thinking, could you have some kind of communication with some friends where you don't necessarily pay attention to it, and you should, <laughs> and it gives you some ideas about either a career that you could do or a job opportunity. That's, and the Uranus could be, when that's triggered, it's, hey, we got a job for you here. Yeah. Yeah, you're welcome. Okay, do you wanna stop there? Is that good? All right, we're gonna we're gonna move on. We're gonna move on. We've got Venus retrograde and we got Mars retrograde. Okay. We'll wait till everybody gets back to their seats here. All right. Okay. Let me get that bell. <laughs> I think for me, I don't. The Venus retrograde seems to be the most fascinating to me because we've got Venus star point, which we're not going to necessarily get into tonight. But um, Venus has a very interesting 
cycle as well as patterns. But anyway, we'll get we'll get to that in a second here. Okay. So Venus also has a synodic cycle, and just to remind you, synodic cycle is we're meeting up, we're meeting up with the sun. Um, and here I'm just giving you some ideas of what we're talking about. So we've got a ratio here of five to eight. And what that really refers to that is this. In an eight year period, we have five Venus retrogrades. And in an eight year period, you have Venus going back to the same sign. There's usually about a two degree difference between the actual degree point that Venus goes retrograde, but it isn't still the same sign. So how does that help you with um, sort of forecasting or um, deciding how can I use this Venus retrograde? By knowing that this Venus retrograde that's gonna be coming up, which will be in two signs, and I'll cover all the dates in that in a second, but that it's gonna be in both Aries as well as Pisces. You can look back, you can take eight years from 2025 and ask yourself what was happening during that time period. You'll have to go back and look at what month and day it actually happened, uh, eight years from 2025. But I found that in my life, that even if this Venus retrograde didn't affect me directly in degrees in my chart, that I could go back, especially with relationships, over eight year period. So you can go then eight years back from that and eight years back from that. Uh, one of them was when I got married. This is many eight years ago. <laughs> I got married. And then the next Venus retrograde was when I met my next husband. <laughs> and then I've got a next Venus retrograde coming up here. So I'm not sure what that's going to be. Um, but that's what you can do. And it tends to go around issues of relationships. But it can also to do, have to do with um, friendships, especially friendships that are from your past, like your childhood memory type things. Okay. So that's, that's a big part of the synodic cycle as well. Now, um, this, this keeps going here forward without me doing anything. Let me just finish off this. Um, so here we're talking about the Venus, uh, the actual time period here. And that is about 584 days or just over 19 months. So that basically says um, in 18 to 19 months from the present Venus retrograde that's going to be coming up next year, in March, April. It won't be for another 18, 19 months that we'll have another Venus retrograde. All right, so when we look at Venus's synodic period, these are just the following phases that it goes through. Now I showed you that visual. I know it's a lot to sort of hold in your mind, but we start off with an inferior conjunction with the inferior planet, Venus, right? And that inferior conjunction has what? The Earth? of Venus and then the Sun, all lined up together. That's called an inferior conjunction. Then what happens is it goes round to the other side of the Sun and that's called a superior conjunction. And it's also the time period when it gets very close to the Sun where you'll hear astrologers talking about Venus disappears. Venus doesn't really disappear. What actually happens, just like with Mercury, it gets so close to the Sun and the Sun is so bright that you can't see, in this case, Venus, but it also applies to Mercury too. And the morning star, so if you get up in the morning and you can see Venus is visible, you can pretty well say that that is probably during the retrograde period. And that lasts for quite a length, a length of time. Both the evening star and the morning star for Venus is about 263 days. And then Venus uh, disappears for eight days. And I guess general, um, General ideas around this disappearance of Venus can also talk to where something may not be clear. So if, for instance, you've got this particular Venus retrograde, we're going to get into the degrees in a minute, um, aspecting you, this time period when Venus for eight days is not visible could be a time period where things are just, you just can't figure it out. And this could have to do with a relationship, either a past relationship coming back in your life. Um, last year when we had... Um, uh, Venus uh, in Leo, I had a lot of my clients start new relationships during that Venus retrograde period. And then they came back to me after it, like even early this year, and talked to me about how there was confusion surrounding it and they had to try to get it back on, on, on course or they couldn't 
communicate well, all that sort of thing can happen if you actually have a relationship starting at a Venus retrograde. So I have a question. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's a good question, and I, I had a lot of thoughts about that last year because there was a number of my clients in this situation. Um, I don't think that you should necessarily hold off. The only thing I would say is that, you know, don't expect this to be necessarily a long-term thing. Now, last time Venus was in uh, a retrograde, it was in the summertime period, right? So we're mainly looking at August, went direct again in September. So it could, I know I said to a lot of my clients, this could just be a summer fling. You're going to have to wait till the Venus retrograde is over. Probably, I think the shadow period, I think, was like the 2nd of October or something last year. Um, so that was my advice to them. So I guess that's my advice to you too. No, I think you can still have that happen. Now, you have to look at where it's happening, right? So say you have this, depending, say you had you know, your own Venus or something like the sun, the moon, the ascendant, the midheaven, was at the degree of the whole um, Mercury going direct, which is at 24, 25 degrees of Pisces, right? Now think about what is Neptune and Pisces representing compared to Venus? It's the higher octave, right? So the ruler of Pisces, which is where this next Venus retrograde will go direct, Neptune, is a higher octave of Venus. And we're talking about a Venus retrograde. So for me, I would say there's a big possibility here of, you know, somebody really significant coming into your life, like a soulmate. And that the path to that soulmate coming true, i.e. after it com Venus comes out of retrograde and shadow, reveals itself to you as this fantastic relationship. So that's why you got to be careful about saying, oh, no, I better not start something at this time. And, and let's just stay with that theme. Because Venus goes um, retrograde in Aries, it could be something that just happens, right? Aries is a big spark. I'm going to go after that. And then you, in the Venus retrograde period, which lasts about 40 days, you say, I'm not sure about this. And then as you, you know, go through the retrograde and into um, Pisces, the realization, maybe the, the mists and the clouds around, you know, in Pisces, start separating as the retrograde ends and you say, this is the full soulmate. So what we connected right to begin with. That's, that's what I would say. Okay. Um, oops. But we covered the 40 days. Okay, so the other time period that we're talking about here with regards to an important point in the Venus retrograde is going to be when Venus conjuncts the sun. It's called a Kazemi, I've not brought this up before, but it is called a Kazemi. A Kazemi basically says, in the heart of the sun. And if you think of it, I think it's more applicable to Venus in some ways, because we do talk about the heart, right? Love. Um, it's also, that time period is going to be, yeah, two Aries on the 23rd of March, 2025. So this is also, we're not doing um, Venus star points in this lecture, but I'm just going to let you know that this particular time is going to be a significant time for those folks either analyzing or deciding, do I want this relationship if somebody comes back into your life? Or um, you've started this relationship and you're thinking, I'm not so sure. This date is going to, so if this is you by chance, Tammy, or a friend of yours, this is going to be an important degree point and this is going to be an important day for making some kind of decisions where something's going to become clear in your mind. So this is halfway through, basically, the Venus retrograde period of 40 days. All right, so where does Venus go retrograde? It goes retrograde at 11 Aries on the 1st of March, 2025. And it goes direct on the 13th of April, 2025 at 24 Pisces. So as I mentioned, you've got the Aries and you've got the Pisces, almost opposite types of energies in some way. But as I mentioned to Tammy, this could be an instant attraction and then either kind of a cooling off and a slow realization as those mists sort of part. Um, but this Pisces can also bring in confusion and at its worst, um, deception. 
So, I mean, you've always got to look at all that stuff, right? So in a Venus retrograde like this, I would say, especially if something, whether it's a new relationship starts suddenly, or you have this person from your past, a past love coming back into your life, jumping into your life again, like an Aries, I would just say, take your time here, especially past relationships, because there's going to be a need and want to connect, right? And that you don't want to wait. But with the Pisces at its highest, this could bring in a very spiritual relationship, right? Or spiritual connection. And as I mentioned already, um, I, I think this may be a time when we actually have some significant progress. Uh, it's hard to imagine right now, but some significant process for a peach, peaceful conclusion to at least one or more of our wars. Okay. I guess it's not our wars, but... Okay, so this is the Venus chart. Let's take a look at it. We've got quite the little thing going on here, right? So we've got Venus. This is Chiron over here. It is a little far from it. It's at 20 degrees of Aries. Uh, Venus here going retrograde is quite close to the moon. That's going to be at nine degrees. So this tells me that at that Venus retrograde, we're going to have both Venus and the moon conjunct. What kind of thing do you think that's going to, what kind of energy do you think that's going to bring in? And just remember that Venus can be females. A lot of emotional energy, for sure. And it's in Aries too, right? Very, assert, that's exactly the word I was looking for. Assertive energy from females. Yeah. And we're looking at March and April here too, right? This is two months of a lot of energy. Hey, and on top of that, we're not talking about eclipses here in this lecture, but do not forget, we've got two eclipses happening in March too. So I would say, especially March next year, so you might want to get out all these different things that were, were especially the Venus retrograde. As I mentioned, we've got a Mercury retrograde basically happening at the same time in almost the same degrees. Um, so ongoing with this, you're going to have the Mercury retrograde. It's not quite retrograde yet, I don't think. Let me just see, where is it? No. It goes direct, I think, a few days, or retrograde a few days later. So they're all going to be playing into each other, and then the eclipses on top. Um, the eclipses will have um, one in Virgo, uh, which I believe is a full moon, and then we're going to have, I think, the final one in... Um, Aries is going to be a final. I think it's at nine degrees of Aries on the 29th of March. Don't ask me how I remember all those things. But yeah, this moon. And then don't forget, remember we talked earlier about um, the fourth house in Cancer? Well, what house and what sign does the moon rule? Cancer. So here we go back again. When I looked at all this, I said, wow, we've got a real emphasis on the homeland, right? That's Cancer. Our home. Uh, the mother, and the family. So I have a feeling March is going to be a big, huge change month where there's going to be this very aggressive and assertive action from women. And hopefully our women, our woman president, <laughs> um, to bring change into the family and bring good change in for um, the mothers of the world too, right? Or the mothers to be in the world. And the family, just the family generally speaking. So I think from a mundane standpoint, that's what we're looking at here with this Venus retrograde. It's going to be a lot of communicating and a lot of negotiating behind the scenes because you've got the Mercury retrograde on top. Does anybody have anything at this degree or the 24, 25 degrees of Pisces? So those are the two degrees, right? It's around 9, 10 degrees of, um, yeah. So that eclipse is going to be at 9 degrees of, of Aries. So the eclipse could eclipse this Venus too. The eclipse, I think, happens like the end of the first week, I think. Yeah, I think, is it, is it late March? Yeah, oh, the, the Virgo one's happening before and then 29th of March, that's right. Yep, yep. Potentially any planet that's at that degree Absolutely, yeah. I mean, the thing is, any, anything between those degrees too, because you're going to have that Venus going back and forth three times, right? It'll go in the shadow period, it'll go forward. 
uh, in a direct motion, it'll go retrograde over it, and then it'll go direct again over it again. So technically speaking, it could really be between two degrees of Aries and 24, 25 degrees of Pisces, anywhere in that sort of geography. But in particular, you want the degree point as a more significant. I'll get you in a second. Uh, and in particular, I always look at, I first of all, look at the sun. And then uh, to just be honest with you, when I do my clients, the sun, and then I look at the ascendant. And then it follows from there. I'll look at the moon. I'll look at stelliums. And then I'll look at the midheaven. That's kind of my order that I do things. But the sun is the most important thing in the chart. The other thing I didn't mention is that, of course, a lot of these things can happen internally, right? And we talked about our value system in that, right? So Venus is also values. So this Venus retrograde for some folks may have you re-examining your values. Why what, what do I need to maybe literally show more value for myself? Do I need to take some certificate courses? Do I need to shift something in my head? Because we've got a Mercury retrograde going on at the same time. I didn't take your question, sorry. Okay. What's the one that's at one degree? Okay, so you may have some, some significant healing going on in the area of love or love for yourself or value for yourself when that whole um, uh, two degrees of Aries is activated. Um, I don't have it up here, but I did have the date on there. It was towards the end of um, March. Um, you can come up afterwards and I'll get it for you. So you, yeah, sometimes to, sometime towards the end of March, that Chiron is going to be activated by that midway point, right, of Venus retrograde still conjunct the sun. So this is going to be some important thing for you to be healing. Uh, what house was that again? The fifth? Oh, well, you may have a new love come into your life. A new love come into your life. A, a child could be more important. Um, a creative project. Or you could also, I mean, at it's, at it's kind of really superficial, but the fifth house is also the house of fun. You know, it's ruled by Leo. And so I would say that it could also be a time when you discover new ways to heal yourself through having fun. I know that's a very superficial thing, but it might be that you say, oh, wow, I wish I had known about this. It's so much fun. So look for that towards the end of March when you've got the Kazemi happening between uh, Venus and the sun. So the other thing, like I mentioned, is this Venus star point thing. Uh, that'll be a whole other lecture for somebody else. Um, but if you want to look... Oh, sorry. Uh, you mentioned the uh, 24 degrees Pisces. Yes. Just, I didn't leave it until tonight, but Tuesday's Venus retrograde at 24 degrees Pisces. That's great. Thank you very much. That's absolutely true. So there's actually another thing about it, too, that Mars squared in the nose of Cancer these next few days. Yes. Yep, yep. So there's a culmination happening in April, March, March, April. Yes. Right now. Yep. Oh. Yeah, that's true. And of course, the other thing to remember too is, we didn't really say much about this, but we've also got um, that square happening with Mars and Pluto ongoing. We've already had one, um, but there's going to be two more that'll happen, be happening during that time period right the way up through the March, April time period too. So that's also bringing in huge change where, man, you know, a lot of assertive action will have to be taken to get rid of stuff that just is not serving us, right? Mainly governments. So that's going to happen on a world stage, I think. Yeah, I'll just, just briefly talk about what you mentioned about the, the Pisces eclipse that's coming up on the, uh, it's, a, it's a full moon eclipse at 24 degrees of Pisces. And the thing is about that is that Hey, if you do have something, did you have something around that degree by chance? Yeah, my son, my son. Okay, so this is for you going to indicate, so watch what happens, I would say, even a week on either side of that, because it's, it, it does aspect your chart. See what happens in terms of themes and areas, because you're going to have that featured starting mid-January, uh, when we have the north, the transiting north nodes go into 29, so the nodes go backwards, so they start at the end of a sign, at 29 degrees, right, of Pisces. And that's going to be for about 18 months they stay there. So you're going to have whatever themes turn up for you 
during that eclipse that's happening this month is going to follow you for 18 months for sure in more depth starting mid-January when the nodes. And because it's 24, 25 degrees, it's going to happen probably around this, this Venus retrograde time period where it gets to 24. The, the nodes themselves get to 24. So this could be significant. Now, what house is that for you? The Pisces one. Your descendant? So your son is on there. So it's your seventh house and your first house with these eclipses then, right? With Virgo and Pisces. So, wow, you can have some significant changes. I don't know if you're married or not, but this could bring in a situation of a serious relationship, like a marriage relationship, but it could also bring in business partnerships or if you work with clients, this could be a big, huge change with clients. What's that? Yeah, well, use the energies that way, right? I mean, the easiest, I know I've already repeated this once, but the easiest way when you know you have something like that significant, so the first house and seventh house are very significant houses for you personally, right? And to work with other people. So I would put together a vision chart. If there's something, let's just say you want to attract in more clients. You've got to put a vision board together now that shows you what you want and you show the universe what you want and then you remind yourself as you look at it, right? So it's kind of like a mirror type thing where you're looking at it and then the universe is looking at you and you're sending out the message. I would do that if I were you, or at least consider it, right? You can do it on Pinterest too if you don't want to get a physical thing, right? Um, okay, all right. Okay. Okay, I think we're just going to go into the houses quickly then. Um, okay, just history. This is kind of interesting. Um, I'll quickly go through this. So that last Venus retrograde in Aries only was in March 2001. And it marked the first country. I didn't realize it was, for some reason I thought it was earlier than 2001, but it wasn't. The Netherlands was the very first country that actually approved gay marriage in 2001. Um, we went on to do that too, but that's all I think up in the air as well. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention was this here too. Um, the last time we had Aries and Pisces involved in the Venus retrograde, which is what we have coming up next year, look at this. It was the first year we elected in the USA uh, an African-American president. And what do we have for the first time coming up here? Yeah, it gives me hope. And then we just talked about the last... Uh, oh, this is an interesting one too. So Venus can also do... It's called occultation of the sun. What it's akin to is like an eclipse, except that it's not the traditional eclipse where we cover something, right? And I don't know if anybody had an opportunity to see this last time, but I did not realize how rare this was. Okay, so did anybody see that, the, the occultation of Venus going across the sun, the 6th of June, 2012, it was in Gemini? Wasn't it awesome? I know, I actually was, this, was it with this guy. <laughs> he had his, all his cameras out and everything, and it was just mind-blowing to just see this going across the sun like that. But look, 20... 17 is the next time we had that happen. Wow. Isn't that crazy? I, I was really surprised, but I had to look that up a couple times. And it's going to be in Sagittarius. So I'm not going to be around at that time, I don't think. Um, but, I'm, but it's my birthday, that's for sure. <laughs> Let's get on to... Uh, we kind of covered most of this already, so I'm not going to go through that. Let's just go through the houses now. So we've only got a few minutes left. Okay, so the first house... Doing this. Um, we're going to have to go through this fairly quickly. So for the first house, this is a personal house, right? And it's all about you, everything around you, everything inside you. So this can be a reconsideration of a relationship. So this could be a time period, along with the fifth house and the seventh house, where you have somebody coming back into your life that's from your past. Um, and you just have to reconsider this. You have to reconsider, do I want to go through this relationship again? Do I want to have this relationship? Okay. Uh, second house is money. So this is where Venus can actually come in here and provide some, uh, something around money. This is a good time to actually wrap things up with regards to um, planning how you spend your money. Third house, love messages are misunderstood. So if you put your third house aspect here, make sure you double check messages regarding waiting to hear from someone that you've maybe fallen in love with. Fourth house is your home. This can just bring in a Venus retrograde. Don't do any remodeling at this time. That's not a good time. And actually, first house also, don't go and get any plastic surgery. Um, 
The fifth house, sorry, I've only got a few minutes here. So sixth house is work. This could, the Venus retrograde could bring two things in. Um, some issue with regards to money, but it can also bring a time period where you can negotiate for more money for yourself during the Venus retrograde time period. Seventh house, there could be some issues around a marriage partnership. It could be something as simple as you're planning a marriage and things happen that don't work out. Things don't look as beautiful as you thought they should be. <laughs> um, it could also bring in money issues as well. Eighth house, um, this is potentially having an adjustment with regards to money, um, especially money through investing or with other people. The ninth house with Venus there, it says, you know, that trip that you're going to take may cost a lot more money than you thought. Maybe the place you were going to looked a lot beautiful, more beautiful in pictures than you thought. Foreign females could bring problems your way. Tenth house is your career. This is you wanting more money in your career and it being delayed. You thought it was all planned, all going forward, and it's just not going forward. But it is a good time to try to negotiate, especially if your boss is a female, for more money in your career. Uh, 11th house is problems with female friends or groups that you belong to. Um, more money may be needed. Maybe um, you know, the group or society you belong to says, well, it's no longer going to be $50 a year. It's now going to be $100 a year to join this club. That sort of thing could come up. 12th house is things like love behind. This is the classic, you know, love in the shadows for whatever reason. This is a love relationship that you can't come out in the open with for whatever reason, right? Um, it can also be a time period where maybe you're entering the metaphysical world and it's just uh, delays are happening with regards to maybe this education that you're really doing. Okay, how much time do I really have left? Uh, you have seven minutes. Okay. Yeah. I'm going to move this, Tammy. I'm going to move it. Okay, we're going to go straight to, we kind of covered a lot of the retrograde periods anyway. Um, Mars retrograde does start um, at six degrees of Leo uh, towards the first week of December this year. And then it goes direct at 17 degrees of Cancer towards the end. Of in Cancer. So here we go again. We're featuring Cancer again, right? And in fact, the retrograde period itself is about three months, but this particular Mars retrograde goes on for about six months. Three months of that in 2025, it's spent in cancer, whether it's retrograde or direct. I think it's in May time period, it comes out of shadow. So cancer is very much featured and all the things we talked about with cancer at this Mars retrograde. Okay, so what is it this is, is about? What, what do you need to be careful? Driving. Oh, for sure, and, and I've had this happen with all Mars retrogrades, you just get frustrated with people not driving right or fast enough or too slow. So be very careful not to speed. Also, egos are gonna be really high at this time. So again, take that 10,000 foot view and the win-win situation. I mean, you sometimes do have to stand up for yourself. I'm not saying that, you shouldn't. Um, but this is gonna be a time period where you're gonna be more prone to be angry, upset, and frustrated. Don't speed, that's for sure. And also, um, don't tax your body, right? If we think about it, Mars is very much part of our body, our system, our body system, and so you don't want to be taxing yourself. So what, what could that equate to in your, what you do day to day? You're working too hard. You're running your body down. Mars retrograde tells you that. Your body tells you that. Then maybe it's time to take a break. Maybe it's time to slow stuff down. Maybe it's time to look at, hey, I'm doing three people's job here. I gotta talk to my boss about this and get this sorted out. A good time to negotiate, a good time to plan. Accidents for sure are potentially more prominent at a Mars retrograde. Now the positive thing is that you're also gonna have um, a wonderful halfway time period. Let me just see if I've got this on here. Uh, a halfway time period where it will actually um, conjunct uh, in, I think it's the 15th, it's the 15th of um, January, we have Mars will actually be conjunct the sun. And this is a time period where if you have been frustrated about maybe a plan not going forward, something not working out, this is a time period where you would, I would maybe meditate or just pay attention to what's happening around you because you may get the message coming in that says, if you do this, if you plan this, this will probably make things turn out for you once the retrograde is done. 
So it's a Mars conjunct uh, the Sun, uh, giving you some information on how you can act. Right? Uh, let me just see what other things here we've got. Yeah, we talked about the Mars square Pluto. Pay attention to these dates too, right? We have um, the 4th of November this year. I've already had one, but that's the next one. The 1st of Jan, and then the 26th of April. You're going to have Mars uh, squaring Pluto. That's those are going to be very difficult. That's don't you don't want to do anything with against the law or not paying attention to the law on those dates for sure. Um, it can also be a time period where you actually have the law coming to you or people in power question you about something or challenging you about something. Um, we talked about it going to Cancer. Do, 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 do. Okay. Let's. Here's the Mars chart, and then we're going to go straight to the houses. Okay, so where is Mars here? Is it in aspect to anything? It's aspect to the part of fortune. I don't really read that too much, but it's at 6 Leo there. What else have we got going on? Opposing Pluto. It is opposite Pluto. Within a few degrees, right? And Venus. Yeah, within a few degrees. Not exact, but it's pretty close. Yeah, I think the squares are the most important thing to pay attention to with this Mars retrograde period in terms of difficulties. Uh, there may be turning points at the Mars square Pluto, but it's going to require some effort on your part to get there. Okay. All right, Mars retrogrades through the houses. Um, all right, so first house. This is going to be a very personal house. This is, if you've got Mars, um, that's in Leo or Cancer, you know, either by retrograde or direct motion. Um, this could be a time period where you really do have major frustrations come into your life, a Mars retrograde in the first house. Um, so really take care of, you know, being aggressive. Do the win-win situation. Um, the second house is going to be money, where, you know, you could have... You can have delays in money, basically. That's what this is, money issues, where there's delays, delays in negotiating for money. Although I would say that a Mars retrograde time period, as long as you have the right mental attitude, can be a good time for negotiating for more money, realizing your value, right? It can also have you planning, I want to get more money, but what do I need to add that's of value? Do I need to get another degree? Do I need to get a certificate course? All that type of thing. Third house is communications. And this does, the third house of communications with Mars there, retrograde, I would say this is going to bring up uh, frustrations with other people, especially neighbors, siblings could become a problem for you. Communications, generally speaking, are just going to be aggressive, assertive. Um, delays may be announced at this time through communications too with the third house. Fourth house is family. This is arguments with the family, especially the mother. I'm going through these fast. Uh, fifth house is creative projects could come to a standstill for some reason. Children, if you've got them, could become agitated for some reason, right? Um, love could go a begging as well at this time, where the Mars retrograde, where someone withdraws their affections. That had just started off, right? Um, sixth house is, um, you know, work-related problems. You run into colleagues that are very argumentative, are just not nice. Um, your boss could become more agitated and be more demanding. Health matters could come up too with the sixth house as well. Um, the seventh house is, of course, any, any other, and typically we talk about our marriage partner or our serious partnerships. It can also be business partnerships and clients could just present problems for you. The eighth house, um, sexual problems could come up here for sure. And then anything to do with your investments. So if you do have something in the eighth house with this Mars retrograde, you definitely want to check out all your investments. Don't leave it to some other expert at this time. Ninth house is travel, foreign people, uh, legal matters, all that type of thing. These are all going to have delays. Definitely get travel insurance if you're traveling. Um, tenth house is your career. So there's going to be some stall potentially in your career. And maybe this isn't going to be a bad thing either. But this can also be a time period where you negotiate moving up your position 
right? The Mars retrograde asks you to negotiate with somebody behind the scenes for your career. Uh, the 11th house is arguments with friends. Yep, arguments with friends. Um, it's also the groups that you belong to. You may just find you're really frustrated with them and you don't agree with what they're saying, that type of thing. Dreams and wishes that you have seem to not come true for you. Don't give up though, right? Mars will go direct. Finish with the 12th house. This could turn out a few ways. Um, if you do have to work for some reason behind the scenes, let's say in a hospital or in a government office, this could have you just working behind the scenes on a project um, at this time during the Mars retrograde. But it can also, on a very negative uh, standpoint, bring out people who are working against you. Um, that's, the, that's the negative thing. The, the, really, yeah, secret, the really good thing about Mars in the 12th house is it says, take a break, go to the ashram. Stop working so hard. All right. We can stop there. I think I'm just about on time here. Yeah. And then if there's, I'll stay here for a few minutes. So if you want to come up, you've got something in your chart that you've not discussed, you can come and do that with me too. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.